So, some of the fights in this card, the judges had an absolute stinker with. But before I talk about that, I want to talk about the first fight with Jimmy Flick versus Malcolm Gordon. And I actually did predict Jimmy Flick to win via first round submission. But he didn't get it because all that happened is Malcolm Gordon charges at you like a bull in a china shop and just starts ground and pounding you. That is the worst strategy to use against a guy with elite jiu-jitsu like Jimmy Flick. Yeah, on the bottom he didn't look great. But when you are so aggressive and you're trying to like even go for like a guillotine attempt against a guy like Jimmy Flick, you give away positions on the ground which then become vital for a guy like Jimmy Flick to get. And you end up bottling getting a 10-8. Like, in that round, he could have got a 10-8 if he just stayed there on top of him, continued to ground and pound, maintain the control, and not look to fight for like a submission or something. He could have maybe got a 10-8, but the second round, like I said in the predictions, I knew Malcolm Gordon would do this. He can't help himself. He is so reckless and aggressive, and he just comes charging forward like Juliana Pena, loses his balance, and Jimmy Flick's able to go around the outside of his leg and bring him down to the ground, and then once he's on the ground, hold my beer, sit down. He is going to get submitted. And it happened, because he has been caught in submission attempts multiple times because of being over-aggressive, or looking to get submissions when he doesn't need to, like against Mohamed Mikhaev, and he ends up getting arm triangled, and it was quite an impressive one because he didn't have both of his legs fully out. He had like one leg in and just used that shoulder pressure to drive into the neck and make him tap out. So that was a good win by Jimmy Flick. But again, there's still my concerns about his bottom game for a jiu-jitsu fighter. He looks so good when he's on top of you. And yes, he got that like triangle choke on Malcolm Gordon, but I would expect a guy like that who got a flying triangle choke over a guy like Cody Durden, a very strong wrestler, to be able to do it to a guy like Gordon. He couldn't, but he got an arm triangle and that was good enough. And then we had Sam Patterson versus Johan Lanes. So I did pick Sam Patterson to win this fight. I was not confident because Sam Patterson, he's got a tendency, just like Curtis Blades, to be confident in his striking. But Blades is obviously a far superior striker and fighter than him. But... What I just don't like about him, I want him to do well. It's the fact that he doesn't look to take the opponent down. He has to wait for his opponent to try and look to do something with him before he gets the memo. Like Johan Lanes caught him early because you'll notice Sam Patterson leaves his chin up quite high when he's leaning back to get out of the way of a punch. And that's why Yano Ashmus, who pressured forward, was able to catch him and knock him out brutally to the point where he was fighting the ref. And he sounds a bit like the guy Chris Smallin. You can type him up if you want. You probably don't know who he is, but he sounds like a more testosterone-filled Chris Smalling. And I know I'm not the guy here to be talking about testosterone with people's voice, but the way how Sam Patterson fights, it just scares me. It really does. And Johan Ness, poor fight IQ, in my opinion, should be 0-4 in the UFC. Probably gone tomorrow. And when he clinched onto him, I'm thinking, what the hell are you doing? Why are you trying to clinch with a guy who's a far superior wrestler and jiu-jitsu fighter than you, plus he's got better cardio than you? Do not look to clinch. Look to close off the cage and then look to land that overhand right like your Tyron Woodley, because that'll work. You got him. But then you start to clinch and then I'm like, oh no, fight over, because Sam Patterson is way better in the clinch. So he's able to drag his head down to the ground and transition to the back. But it's the way he kind of like swept the leg. He didn't like do a traditional back take. He kind of like took a quarter of the back and then sweep the leg with his left foot and took Johan Lanes' right foot and then put himself in the rear naked choke position. And Johan Lanes was done at that point. He looked like a fish out of water. He could not do anything. And I think they should do a fight with Phil Rowe. Look at him. It's a perfect fight to make. He's never been submitted before. He's only been knocked out once and he goes to a decision quite a lot. But in the UFC, we have seen him knock people out. Like we saw him care a guy like Nico Price. And I think that would be an interesting matchup. Like how would he deal with a guy like Phil Rowe on the feet? Who did lose to Neil Magny, but you could argue he won that fight. And it was just such a scruffy, weird type of fight to score. So, yeah. Right, Sidhi Sahi versus Tavares. Right, in my opinion, daylight robbery. If you want to talk about the judges having a stinker, it was this fight here. And please, I don't want to hear the debate about the second round because what people will be saying is 
Look at his face. The judges, I feel like they based this win off how he bled. If he weren't bleeding and his face looked normal, I can guarantee you he would have won that fight. And it wasn't just because of the blood. It was the combinations he was landing. Don't get me wrong, Tavares in the second round specifically, he has extremely good head movement and footwork. I have never, ever seen Tavares fight like that. He's usually more stationary, but in this fight, he was moving like it was Dominic Cruz with that head movement at times. And then countering with that, what was it called? His counter right cross and looking to like check hook him or come off to an angle and look to throw the hook because Sid, he's given me vibes of Dan Hook, the way he was pressuring. He can eat a shot. Yeah, he almost got dropped in the first round. He didn't, but he almost did. And he stayed on his feet, and it just shows you how good his chin is, and he's willing to pressure, and he's got the blonde hair like Dan Hooker as well. I'm sorry, I do not see the argument for Tavares winning that fight. I can see the argument for some of the other fights on this card, which people might call, quote, quote, a robbery or a controversial fight. But this fight here, daylight robbery. You can't just be on the defensive and land one strike, and it didn't even affect Sid here in the second round specifically. There was no damage really done to him. It was just the redness from the previous round getting worse and worse. But it doesn't mean he was doing more damage because it was just a visual from the first round. But in this round, he was getting wobbled. It looked like Tavares at times, but he just kept moving in the head. Uh, what was it? The head movement and the footwork was just saving him. And then in round three, output slowed down even more. And Sid, he was making up all of these like, new combinations, flying knee from a leg kick and measuring the distance and then throwing off a hook. His striking looked so complex. And unfortunately, I feel bad for him because he beat him before. I know it was an early stoppage, which it was, and they did need to have a rematch. But for them to go and rob him, and especially when you're in his country as well. Well, I know he's from Ukraine, but he's also got that Canadian in him. I'm surprised why the judges did that. I think sometimes the judges just look at the face and be like, well, it was a bit more red, so therefore he won this fight. No. And then we had Sean Woodson against Charles Jourdain. I hope I'm not coming off as narcissistic, but I also did pick Sean Woodson to win this fight. I know I didn't go perfect on the card, but this fight here, it just seemed like it was inevitable to happen because Sean Woodson, he doesn't really throw a lot of kicks where it can put him off balance. I'll be very light. He looks very like calm and composed in there. Charles Jourdain was struggling with the range. And he kept doing these like weird spinning kicks to the head of Sean Woodson. And because he's so tall, if you're going to land them on his chin, you need to close the distance even better. But he was throwing them out of range without a setup. Woodson having that boxing background, he's got good reaction time. He can read it from a mile away and was doing like these shoulder brushes, lookaways at times. And he was just schooling him out there. You could argue he won 30-27. I don't think he did. I think it was 29-28. Jordan in the third round. Because I think Sean Woodson in his mind knew that he had won the fight after the first two rounds. Because he was just confident, jabbing away at his head. Then throwing a hook and then a cross combination. Seeing Jordan's head snap back because he ain't got the reach to compete with the jab of Sean Woodson. And him being much taller as well. Like Sean Woodson... He's got no glute development, but he does look bigger than Jordan. He's like a really unconventional type of build where he's long. He's kind of, he's not muscly at all, but he's got a bit of meat on his frame now, but he's not muscly. He's just a guy who's got one of the most weird physiques to deal with for a guy who he wants you to throw kicks or he wants you to be able to go down to the ground to actually deal with him. And he couldn't because he's tall. He's got a long base. It's hard to take them down sometimes, these tall guys, especially when they know what they're doing. And Charles Jordan just constantly went for a single leg, no like double leg attempt. So it was a very confident, and the judges at the end, I almost had a heart attack when I saw that Sean Woodson, no, I didn't bet on it or anything. What happened there? I was like, how has Charles Jordan won that? I was about to say that was a complete rubbery. And then they're like, oh, no, no, we made a mistake, Sean Woodson. So, again, Charles Jourdain probably lost a bit of dopamine after hearing that. But great performance by Sean Woodson, who was actually quite underrated, in my opinion. Beat the likes of Terence McKinney as well. But it almost became a rubbery, which is why I put it in the thumbnail. Brad Katona versus Garrett Armfield. 
you might want to call this a stinker one. It's a pick em type of fight in terms of who do you think won that. I do think Garrett Armfield, after watching it again, did actually win that fight rounds one and two. And Brad Katona had a good like last 20 seconds of the second round, but that doesn't win you the round. And the first round, I don't know why I didn't pick Armfield. I was going to, but I thought, right, I'm picking too many underdogs at this point. But I knew why I was picking them, but I just thought if I pick him again, my whole picks could end up just turning into a mess. Because, yes, I believe there was a chance he could win it, but I didn't say it in the prediction, so I can't really say that now. But anyways, with Garrett Armfield, he likes to level change, throw the jab, and then start to move. That's how he fights. And it works so effectively against a guy who is your height and has got a shorter reach. Like, Brad Katona cannot compete when it comes to throwing a jab against Garrett Armfield. Logically, it just can't happen. So he was looking to use that left hook. But because the range of Brad Katona is not as good as Garrett Armfield when it comes to using it, Brad Katona likes to fight on the inside, it's so much harder for him to use that hook effectively compared to when he used it in the last fight. And that's weird, because in that last fight he had in the, what was it called? The Ultimate Fighter. He struggled with a similar thing with the range earlier on and started to come back as he got tired. But Garrett Armfield doesn't really get tired. It didn't really look like it. And in the third round, that's the only time where you could say that Brad Katona was able to take advantage when he was looking to use that like clinching and grappling. But Garrett Armfield using the level changing and then firing off with that right cross quite a few times, it lands on Brad Katona's chin. And Garrett Armfield has power, but Brad Katona has a chin. So it's very hard to finish a guy like that, but it is very possible to beat him to a decision. And I think he just did it. But if you said Brad Katona won, I couldn't argue with that. Well, I could, but it wouldn't be like something you call a rubbery. But the judges, they still had a stink and it's this fight right here. I'm only joking. Arnold Allen versus Mozart Evloev. In my opinion, I'm giving it to Arnold Allen. And please don't say it's about because you're from England. That's not why I'm saying it. That first round, there was not really much from either fighter. But from what I can remember, it was the fact that Arnold Allen, he was applying so much pressure to Mozart Evluev and he was staying on the back foot. And actually, Mozart Evluev, remember, significant strikes aren't always perfect, but from here, he only landed one more strike, and you might say, because he got the takedowns, therefore he won the fight. No, and I'm gonna tell you why. Because with those takedowns that he was doing, where was the ground and pound? If you wanna talk about ground and pound numbers or strikes that are on the ground, Arnold Allen actually ended up landing more, but I don't know if they've counted those knees from round three. But anyways, in that first round, those takedowns, he was landing them, but as soon as he lands them, Arnold Allen is looking to scramble, he's rolling, and he's not able to effectively do anything with the takedowns. And like people are complaining about in the fight with Sean Strickland and Plessy, with the fact that he weren't able to do any damage, even though he's getting the takedowns, you don't really score them as anything effective. I'm looking at the pressure from Arnold Allen, as well as the striking, and that his strikes were way more effective. They were harder, Mozart Evloev's were lighter, until the second round, of course, where he actually rocks Arnold Allen, and I was like, oh my god, is he going to get finished in this round? And the stats have actually got it wrong as well. Mozart Evloev did knock him down, actually. He did. It was the small jab, that, and I was surprised. Arnold Allen's got a chin on him, so to get dropped by like a jab like that, I'm very surprised about, like, we have seen him get knocked down by a guy like Dan Hooker and bounce straight back up. But that was like from a hook. This was from a straight jab by Mozart Evloev. And also, DC, he never gave credit to Arnold Allen for the defensive grappling. It was always about, when was Mozart Evloev going to land the takedown? Like, what he was doing offensively, he gave him all the credit. But when Arnold Allen's defending it, rolling, doing all the right things and not allowing Mozart Evloev to land any ground and pound at all or get any effective submission attempts. Believe it or not, Arnold Allen had more submission attempts than him, but he didn't win that second round. It just shows you how much he loves the biases towards these Dagestani Russian fighters who are good at wrestling. And there's no point in me saying get rid of these no knees rules because we all know that should happen. But what I will say is those knees were illegal. No, they were legal, not illegal. They were legal. So I don't know why Mark Goddard loves doing stuff like this where something's happening in a fight. He just makes some bottle job decisions. He really does. Like with the Colby Usman, 
in this fight with the knees because that could have been a near fight ending sequence like with them knees and because he was given time to recover he was given more of a chance to be back in that fight like let's say that fight didn't get stopped to that point who knows Arnold Allen might have finished Mozart Flewev so in my opinion he won that fight rounds one and three clear as day okay no not clear as day in round one you could maybe give that to Evloev. But in my opinion, the defensive grappling and the strikes that Arnold Allen landed in that first round, plus the pressure as well, is what, in my opinion, gave me the idea that he won that fight. But round three, I'm sorry. They've rubbed Arnold Allen in terms of them knees. I'm not going to say the fight was a rubbery, but them knees by Mark Goddard, he has rubbed Arnold Allen there. And I'm surprised. I thought he might have had more of a bias to an English fighter as well, considering he is, but... Obviously he doesn't, which is great, but we all know that was wrong with the knees and yes, you could give it to Evloev, but in my opinion, from what I saw in that first round, I have to give it to Arnold Allen. And in that third round, he got screwed. And what's the shame about that is Arnold Allen's gonna see like, oh, uh, I don't know, and I broke my hand and stuff. Yeah, and he said to Lois, oh, I like butter, butter, he said. I don't know what I'm talking about right now, but. That accent was probably horrific, considering I'm from the same place as him. But anyways, yeah. Mike Mallott versus Neil Magny. Like, oh my god. Neil Magny... I don't even know how to describe this guy. Gatekeeper, whatever you want to call him. Beats a guy like Jeff Neal, which I still to this day just don't get how it happened. Seeing how good his takedown defence was against people like Bilal Mohammed and how good it is in general. And Mike Mallott, believe it or not, in this fight... His boxing looked poor. Neil Magny, I think he was having a problem with Neil Magny at range with his striking. The boxing, not striking. Because Mike Mallott was doing very well when it came to like throwing leg kicks to Neil Magny. Because he learned off Ian Gary. Chop up the legs of um, Neil Magny because he doesn't check them or teep them. He just tries to step back and get out of the way of them. So if you can keep throwing them, you're going to damage the legs, which he did. He outlanded him in the first two rounds. He was beating him in the clinch. He was taking him down. He was doing ground and pound. He was getting submission attempts. But I think them submission attempts, they can gas your arms out. Like if you keep going for submission attempts and you're not getting them and you're using all your strength to make him submit, you're going to build up lactic acid in your arms and you're going to get tired. And that happened in the third round because you see that two minutes and 45 minutes left of the round, he's on top of him, Mike Mallock. He looks like he's coasting his way to the win and he loses the position and then he looks to go for a guillotine and he should not do that because even though Neil Magny is not that hard to submit, you are going for a lot of submissions in this fight and going for like that guillotine that high on the neck, you better get it because if you don't, you're going to gash your arms out and I'd love to see what the odds were at that point in the fight because... He should have won that at that point. Like, how do you bottle the fight? This bottling is on the level of Chael Sonnen and Anderson Silva. That type of bottling, because you had two minutes and 45 minutes left, yet you lose a position on the ground. He gets on top of you. You let him pass them out with ease without, like, shrimping or moving, and you just shell up. He doesn't even, like, move on the ground. Like, when a guy's on mount, you better keep moving. The worst thing you can do in mount is just stay on your back or on your shoulder and not kind of like create angles. Because if you don't create angles on the ground, you're going to be trapped. And his arm weren't even trapped. That weren't the problem. He just probably was tired and was like, at this point, I can't do anything. I'm too tired. I can't really move. I've got no energy. And just allows himself to get grounded and pounded. And this referee, it was like he was giving Mike Mallet all the benefits of the doubt. I thought for one minute he was going to survive this fight. Like, imagine if he did, and I don't think he would have been given a 10-8 in this round. Arguably, you could say it might have been, but because of what Mike Mallett was doing earlier, it might have only been a 10-9. So he probably would have either won it or got a draw. But the referee, after a while of just watching him get pummeled to the head, finally was like, right, let me stop this. 16 seconds left of the round. Fight over. And it makes me think, Mike Mallett was being wayly overrated going into this fight that's not even a word he was being way overestimated for how good he is he's a good prospect but you have to look at the opponents he's beaten if you look at the opponents Mike Mallott's beaten they're not even that good and I know 
on your way up, you're not going to beat amazing people, but he's beating people like Adam Fugit, who's just mid. Johan Lanessi should be 0-4. Mickey Gall, not in the UFC. Simon Skorowski, not in the UFC either. But I don't know where this hype was coming from. We've seen him submit these guys, and he looks impressive in the fights, but we know Neil Magny is the gatekeeper of the division. So I should have paid attention to that and how... Mike Mallott, his boxing, I don't know what it was, it must have been he panicked in front of the crowd because his boxing just looked poor, the leg kicks looked good, the wrestling looked good, but he just couldn't finish Magni and he just ends up throwing away this fight and it's unfortunate for him, but Neil Magni again shows he's still got it and it's going to keep happening, it's the fight where you do not expect it with Magni to happen where it happens, so... It's a good win for Neil Magny, but I just don't get how he's pulled that off. All right, Drukas de Plessy. You saw what happened with Sean Strickland earlier. Most people are going to be saying that Strickland won the fight. I get it, yeah. I didn't think he did, and I stand by that. But in my opinion, you have to give Sean Strickland the rematch. I don't want him to get the rematch, but it doesn't make sense. How can you fight a fight where it was like Volkanovski and Makachev where we all thought, well, not all of us, but a lot of people thought that Makachev lost that fight. But then Volkanovski was never going to get that rematch unless it was on short notice. Will that happen with Duplessis and Strickland where you have a crowd who thought this guy won the fight, but then you have the other crowd where you thought the other guy won the fight and he doesn't want to fight again and he wants to look at fighting the next fighter. So if I had to make a prediction, it's really hard to think what the UFC would do because Dana White said that Sean Strickland won. So I wouldn't be surprised if he gave him another fight. But that being said, he might look at the fact that he's got to make money. So if he can make a fight with Adesanya and Duplessis in Africa, even though as of right now, Adesanya don't deserve it, but you know for a fact that Duplessis really wants to fight him because of the beef that they've had, which you know about. So that's the fight I think they should do. And I would rather see that. But if I had to pick what's fair, that's not fair at all. It has to be Strickland. But I would much rather see Adesanya against the Plessy. That's how I feel about it. Because Adesanya should be looking at fighting a Hamza Shemaev. But either way, if he fights a guy like the Plessy, that is a horrible matchup for him. But the only difference I'd say about him and with Strickland is when the Plessy is coming forward, Adesanya likes to counter strike going backwards. Strickland, he didn't really look to counter strike. It was more of a thing where. When De Plessis weren't striking and he was coming forward, he'd like try and throw a jab in his face. Adesanya will look to throw those crosses, like I mentioned in the predictions. No, like I mentioned in the breakdown video with Strickland where in, I believe, round four, like late round four, when De Plessis was coming forward, he was starting to land the overhand right at times. And I think knowing what Adesanya did to Alex Pereira, he'll be looking to do the same thing. Because we know Dreykus likes to overcommit with punches, Adesanya will have those openings to land that right cross like he did to Alex Pereira because he's very good at countering with that right cross. So if you overcommit and you start sawing in, that could happen to him. But as of right now, I think Duplessis has got a very good chance if he can mix up the takedowns. We've seen Adesanya get up from guys like Vittori, Robert Whittaker, but Drakus Duplessis is a much better wrestler than him. He's bigger than them. Look what happened in the Jan Blahovic fight with his grappling. And he don't even really go for takedowns. So imagine a talented wrestler like Duplessis getting hold of Adesanya. And you've got to remember, Duplessis, he was getting these takedowns on Strickland and he was bouncing back up. But we know Strickland's got elite takedown. Uh, what's the word? Get-ups. So like you take him down, he'll bounce straight back up. So does Adesanya to an extent, but he's more like possible to hold down, especially with the wrist control that Duplessis could do. He didn't really do it with Strickland, but that was because he was putting him on his shoulder. I think he will get him on all four knees, not in a weird way. And he'll be able to take the risk from that position against Adesanya. And like I said, like we saw against Blahovic, we could see that type of thing happening. So yeah, I think Strickland has to get it, but I'd rather see Adesanya to Plessy in Africa. It'd make more money, even though Strickland's becoming more of a pay-per-view draw now. I'd much rather see that. So yeah. Thank you for watching. Talk to you soon.